Super tasks are a broad group of, well, tasks that at first glance seem to have quite a simple definition. A countably infinite sequence of operations that occur sequentially within a finite interval of time. Okay, maybe that's not so simple. But this idea becomes far less simple the more you look into it. To understand the problem of super tasks, we first need to find some definitions for our definition. First, what is a countably infinite sequence of operations? Well, countably infinite is just the idea of listing every single number. A set of numbers is countable if its cardinality, meaning the number of elements in this set, is less than or equal to aleph null, the cardinality of this set of all natural numbers. A set is then countably infinite if its cardinality equals aleph null. That can be pretty confusing, but the idea of being countably infinite is very important to this definition, as when the sequence of operations becomes uncountably infinite, that turns into what are called hypertasks, and then after hypertasks come ultratasks. But that gets way too complicated and not really relevant, so we're going to stick with our countably infinite supertasks. The second part of the definition, that occur sequentially within a finite interval of time, just means that the events are happening one after another and finish in a real amount of time, like two seconds. So now we have a better understanding of what a super task is. Unfortunately, here comes the first big hitting philosophical question of the day. Are super tasks even possible? The first examples of super tasks goes all the way back to 450 BCE with the Greek philosopher Zeno of Alea. Zeno created many of these ideas and examples that created paradoxes, most of which were pretty idiotic and had conclusions that only worked if looked at completely devoid of logic, like motion being nothing more than an illusion. Yes, he thought motion wasn't real. But while the conclusion might make no sense when taken out of the context of a philosophical idea, the concept itself is very interesting. His most famous paradox is what is typically referred to as just Zeno's paradox, and very briefly it states that in order to arrive at a destination, say from point A to point B, one must first reach the halfway point to the destination, and then must reach what is the halfway point between this point and the destination, and so on and so forth, which begs the question of whether someone will ever reach the goal. Hence him believing motion was just an illusion as he believed the answer to be no. Thompson's lamp, devised by James F. Thompson, is one of the most interesting modern examples of a super task. Imagine you have a lamp that you can turn on or off using a switch. You set a timer for one minute and then turn the lamp on. Then you wait half a minute and turn the lamp off and then on again after a quarter of a minute. Then you turn it off again after an eighth of a minute and so on waiting half as long to flip the switch each time as you previously did. When a timer stops, you will have switched the lamp on or off an infinite number of times. So, the question is, will the lamp be on or off when the timer hits zero? This is where the super task seems to become a paradox, and why the inventor of the paradox, James F. Thompson, deemed all super tasks to be impossible. The lamp cannot possibly be on because every time it's on, the switch stops immediately after. And it can't be off because every time it's off, the switch is on immediately after. People have tried to answer this problem in multiple ways, with the most promising solution requiring you to look at the problem as if it were an infinite series. If you assign the lamp being on with the number 1 and the lamp being off with the number 0, then you can set up the problem as a sum s equaling. 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1, and so on, where you add 1 to get to position 1, and then subtract 1 to get to position 0. This is equal to the divergent series, negative 1 to the n. However, you can rearrange the sum to look like this. Everything in the parentheses is equal to the sum of the original equation, so this just becomes s equals 1 minus s meaning that s has to be equal to 1 half. So there's the answer. After switching the lamp on and off an infinite amount of times, the lamp will be at 1 half when time is up. But that doesn't really mean anything, because the lamp cannot be half on. This is why Thompson declared that the paradox is unresolvable. However, 
A man named Paul Benesaroff stated that the premise upon which Thompson founded his paradox was inherently mistaken, because it only works for times less than t equals 1. At t equals 1, the lamp stops flickering completely, so the idea that the lamp can't be on due to immediately being turned off, or vice versa, doesn't really make sense. But this still doesn't explain whether or not the lamp is on at the end, leading to a slightly unsatisfying conclusion. There is one more paradox that seems relevant for our question, and that is the Ross Littlewood paradox. This one is a little more complicated than Thompson's lamp, but has interesting results. Imagine that there is some jar that could hold infinitely many marbles, and there is a collection of infinite marbles labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. At time equals 0, marbles 1 through 10 are placed in the jar, but marble 1 is taken out. Then at t equals 0.5, marbles 11 through 20 are put in, but now marble 2 is taken out. At t equals 0.75, marbles 21 through 30 are put in the jar, and marble 3 is taken out. This leads to the setup that for t equals 1 minus 0.5 to the n, the marbles 10 n plus 1 through 10 n plus 10 will be added and the marble n plus 1 will be taken out. The question this paradox asks is, at t equals 1, how many marbles will be in the jar? The situation can be graphed as so, with a line showing the output, input, and total marbles in the jar. From this and the fact that at each step, there are more marbles in the jar than before, and more are being added than removed, it seems obvious that at t equals 1, there would be infinitely many marbles. But some argue that there would in fact be no marbles left in the jar, because every marble in will, at some point, be removed in a subsequent step. But here's where things get a little off the rails. Sheldon Ross, one of the namesakes of the paradox, looked to solve the problem with probability. Instead of the marble in plus one being removed, he looked at the problem as being like so. At each step, a random marble is removed, not the n plus one marble. If EN is the event that the marble marked 1 is still in the jar after making N withdrawals, then the probability of EN is equal to 9 times 18 times 27 all the way to 9N divided by 10 times 19 times 28 all the way to 9N plus 1. This is because if marble 1 is still in the jar after N withdrawals, the first marble withdrawn could be any of the 9 others, then 18 for the second as there are 19 marbles before the second withdrawal then 27 for the third as there are 28 marbles, and so on. The event that marble 1 is in the jar at t equals 1 is then just the intersection from n equals 1 to infinity of en. Now, because en, when n is greater than or equal to 1, are decreasing events, the probability that marble 1 is in the jar at t equals 1 is the probability of the intersection from n equals 1 to infinity of en, which is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of the probability of en. This in turn equals pi, or the product, from n equals 1 to infinity of 9n over 9n plus 1. Hold on, because we're only about a third of the way there. We now need to show that that last equation equals 0. Because the product from n equals 1 to infinity of 9n over 9n plus 1 is equal to the inverse of the product from n equals 1 to infinity of 9n plus 1 over 9n, this is the same as showing that the product from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 plus 1 over 9n equals infinity. Almost done. Now for all m greater than or equal to 1, the product from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 plus 1 over 9n is greater than or equal to the product from n equals 1 to some value m of 1 plus 1 over 9n which equals 1 plus 1 over 9 times 1 plus 1 over 18 times 1 plus 1 over 27 all the way to times 1 plus 1 over 9m, which is greater than 1 over 9 plus 1 over 18 plus 1 over 27 all the way to plus 1 over 9m, which equals 1 over 9 times the sum from i equals 1 to some value m of 1 over i. Hence, letting m approach infinity, and because the sum from i equals 1 to infinity of 1 over i equals infinity, as it is a divergent p-series, we can get the product from n equals 1 to some value m of 1 plus 1 over 9n equals infinity. 
So, letting fi be the event that marble 1 is in the jar at t equals 1, we have now shown that the probability of f1 is equal to 0. So we can similarly show that the probability for fi equals 0 for all values i. To do this, we just need one more theorem, Boole's inequality. This simply states that for a countable set of events, the probability of at least one of the events happening is no greater than the sum of the probabilities of the individual events. So the probability that the jar is not empty at t equals 1 is the probability of the union from 1 to infinity of fi must be less than or equal to the sum of the probability that any marble i is in the jar, which we know is equal to 0. So we get this equation. The probability of the union from 1 to infinity of fi is less than or equal to the sum from 1 to infinity of the probability of fi, which we know equals 0, so the probability of the union from 1 to infinity of fi by Boole's inequality must also equal 0. Therefore, at t equals 1, the probability of the jar not being empty is 0, making the probability of the jar being empty 1. Wow, that was a lot. After all of that, it might be easy to forget why we went down that whole probability rabbit hole in the first place. But by using Boole's inequality in combination with the math we just did, we can show that with probability 1, which means for certain, the jar will be empty at t equals 1. Okay, quick recap for our findings with the Ross Littlewood paradox. When using this setup where the n plus 1th marble is removed from the jar, it is unknown for sure how many marbles will be in the jar at t equals 1, but it's most likely infinite. But when removing a random marble from the jar, at t equals 1 there will be no marbles left. Because of this, this situation seems to be resolved, or at least with Ross's setup, it is solved. This would seem to lead to the conclusion that yes, with the right setup and some lengthy complicated math, super tasks are possible. In truth, we do not have a definite answer to any of these problems. As far as we know, super tasks don't exist in the real world. You'll never have a lamp that can turn on or off arbitrarily fast, nor will you ever have a jar that can contain an unlimited amount of marbles. So we have no way of knowing whether or not the lamp is on at the end, or how many marbles are in the jar at the end. These are all just hypothetical problems. However, while super tasks may not be physically possible, we can still ask whether super tasks are logically possible, regardless of what the laws of nature are. And to answer that question, they may or may not be possible, who knows? Maybe someday we'll figure out the answer to these problems. Or maybe we don't, 